It's great to be with you on this Palm Sunday. Uh, I am very excited to be opening up the scriptures together uh, with you, Church of the Resurrection. Um, It's always encouraging uh, on my end to pray and prepare and to listen to what God would have us to hear uh, from his holy word. I'm going to start with a question uh, that kind of gets to the core of some of what we're experiencing right now as a culture and as a community. Do you know what the most common command is in Scripture? Most of you probably do. Do not fear. Be not afraid. Fear is universal, isn't it? But not everybody's afraid of the same things. That's the tricky part. Just prior to the COVID pandemic hitting our nation, my family and I went out to a state park. We rented an RV for a few nights, and we were going to have a spring break together. And spring had sprung. There were bugs everywhere, new growth everywhere. And one night, as we tried to uh, get the kids kind of settled in a very small uh, space, uh, we had numerous crane flies. I now know this is what they were. I had to do a little research flying all over the RV. And Emery, our daughter, just totally lost her cool. Thought that they were giant mosquitoes that had come to take over and kill us. Uh, Tucker, Jen, and I, uh, we tried not to chuckle, but we tried to calm her down. That's the thing about fear is we're not all afraid of the same things. Some of us are afraid of bugs. Some of us are afraid of heights. Some of us are afraid of snakes, but this morning I'm not necessarily talking about those kinds of fears. I do want to ask you to think about with me, what are you afraid of? What do you fear? The most common command in Scripture is the most common because fear is so universal. It's the most important question that you can ask yourself, what is it that I fear? Who or what do I fear? Because what will happen is as you begin to answer the question, it will start to point you to those things that you trust in for your well-being. It will even point you possibly to who or what you worship. Early on in life, often we begin to realize that the world sometimes feels out of control. Soon enough, we come to know that we're not really in charge, that we can't control life, we can't control this world. And we were already living in what many would call the age of anxiety prior to the pandemic hitting. That's the way people would describe uh, our globe, our world, our culture, the age of anxiety. But now fear is everywhere and everyone feels it in their own way. And even though here we are as children of God, followers of Christ, we're commanded to not be afraid, the truth is you and I still experience the challenge and problem of fear in our own lives too. A couple years ago, I was undergoing a pretty significant challenge with anxiety. I had never experienced anything like it before. And I began sharing this with people that I love and that I know love me. And one in particular person, my spiritual director and coach, um, I told him about it. And I said, I can't really put my finger on it. I can't answer the question that I'm asking you to answer right now. I said, I can't put my finger on it, but I'm struggling with some anxiety. And um, in his wisdom, he said, yeah, that's actually kind of what anxiety is. It's, It's fear without a face. And through conversation and prayer, Uh, we began to name some of those fears. And it was really helpful. One of the other things that he asked me to do is he said, well, he asked it as a question at first. He said, uh, "Have have you talked to Jesus about it? Have you talked to God about it? And he wasn't trying to be paternalizing or uh, overly spiritual. He was genuinely, as a friend, asking me, have you talked to God about it? And at that time, the reality was I hadn't. I hadn't. I began to do that. I began to share it with him. I began to pray about it. I began to study the scriptures and see what would he have me to know and believe, not only about this world, but about myself. And even though I and we still will face fear and anxiety, I hope you will be encouraged by what my own heart was encouraged with, particularly as we look at the life of Jesus this week, this this holy week, as we call it. It starts on this day as he enters into the city. The first thing that I want you to see is that we have a king, King Jesus, who is without fear. 
as he sets out this holy week. He knows what is coming and he is, I love this word, he is intrepid. He is not alarmed. He is without fear. The the Old Testament reading that we just heard says that he set his face like flint and he stands up and he says to, to his adversary, who will contend with me? He's going into battle and he's without fear. What I have begun to discover is not only is King Jesus not alarmed, but you and I are a part of a family of faith with a heritage of not being afraid with a heritage of following in the footsteps. I know he's our king. He's also our big brother, King Jesus, who sets the example for us this week. And so in the words of Zechariah, would you behold him this week? Behold Jesus, our intrepid king. He tells us that when he's high and lifted up, when we behold him, that he draws us and all people into himself. And what we know this week is he is utterly majestic as a king this week. He acts deliberately in his entrance, although he had previously avoided these kinds of actions. Prior to this moment and this week and this day, Jesus had avoided actions that would cause the crowds to sort of become really enthusiastic about his kingship, but not today and not this week because now is the time. Jesus talked about that. He said, now's the time. And so he's going to mount upon this colt and he will ride into the city. He will ride into the city like a king. His actions are deliberate. He's knowledgeable. He he gives these details instructions in the passage we just heard read in Matthew. He says to his disciples, go into the city, and when you go, you're going to find a cult. Um, He's knowledgeable of what's coming. There's even a prearranged password. He says the Lord needs it. That's what you're to tell the owner. It's a strange thing to say when you meet the owner of the cult. It literally says, tell them the owner needs it. The king needs it. He acts with unquestioned authority. Matthew's wanting us to see that everything Jesus is doing is fulfilling the prophet's promise that the king will return and he is the one. Behold our intrepid king. He rides into the city on this day. And what he does is he provokes us. He provokes the observers on that day as well as his own worshipers to make a contrast between him and Pilate. This was a highly political moment in the city of Jerusalem. Crowds of people had gathered in this great city for the week of Passover. And the politicians in their midst were going to seize the opportunity. And so Pilate, he makes an entrance this week, the week of Passover, through the main gate of the city. And his entrance is meant to be contrasted with the choice of our king who also makes an entrance. If you uphold these two parades, if you will, you begin to see just how different our king is than this world. If you were to see Pilate's parade, what you would see is legions of chariots, horses, foot soldiers, all dressed for battle, all armed with swords, spears. Rome's authority would not be questioned. There would be kind of a majesty about that whole parade. If you've seen the film Gladiator, there's a parade or two in that of an emperor and you get the idea. It's a pretty majestic scene that's meant to inspire awe and fear and even forced submission. Now, would you contrast that with the entrance of our king? At the east gate, really the back gate, this other parade gets underway. It's carefully planned. It's intentional. But it was a counter procession, a counter parade It's a different vision of a kingdom, a different kingdom. And Jesus is meaning to do this in this highly political moment, in this crowded moment in the city of Jerusalem. He wants to show just how different his kingship and kingdom are. Here he is in his humble garden. Here he is not with a sword, but actually headed towards a cross, surrounded by a bunch of Galileans who would have been easily dismissed You know, some fishermen are his most loyal followers, maybe a tax collector or two. And the crowd's waving palm branches. No great banners, no army, no chariots. And yet this is a humble and triumphal entry. What is he doing? He's showing us just how different his way is than the way of this world. He is going to bring peace. 
He is going to bring peace. And the way that he walks in this day is so counter to the way of the world. In their book, The Last Week, the authors write, Jesus' procession deliberately countered what was happening on the other side of the city. Pilate's procession embodied the power and the glory and the violence of the empire that ruled the world. But Jesus' procession embodied an alternative vision. We know that it's the vision of the kingdom of God. And the way that he walks and the way that he talks, it might be limited to Jesus if he had not commanded his disciples and then in turn, you and I, to walk and to talk in this same way. It was earlier in his journey with his disciples that he told them, I am going to go to Jerusalem and I am going to face death and I will die on a cross. And he says, if you're my disciple, you will also walk in this way. You will take up your own cross. And so he invites us. Our intrepid king invites us along the same path as him. He, he rides into the grave this week as one who knows that he'll be, be victorious on Easter Sunday. So how, how can you and I be his disciples? Well, I want to talk about that. I, I want to talk about how do we become intrepid disciples? I... Um, I think that we have to be honest and say that it's a little different than mayflies or crane flies, that the fears that we're facing right now um, are really weighty and significant. And can we actually be a people that are marked by faith and not fear? Can we actually be a people that are intrepid? I want to point out two ingredients. That's it, just two ingredients that make up uh, sort of the vaccine, if you will, to fear. It's the antidote to fear. And you and I have full access. There, there is plenty. There is enough. There's more than enough of these two things. One is there's a truth to know, and two, there's a helper to invite. So here's the truth to know. This week, more than ever, what you see on display in the life of Jesus is that he knows that he is utterly safe in the kingdom of God. He is safe in the kingdom of God. That's the truth I want us to know, to experience, to reflect on this week, that you and I, if we are his disciples, that we know that we are safe in his kingdom. This means, uh, and it, it, it takes time to learn this, it took Peter time to learn this, this means we can put away our swords. This means that, that we don't wage war, we don't embody the kingdom in the same way this world wages war. You'll hear these words on Maundy Thursday, this coming week when we meet together again virtually. John 13, verse 3, Jesus says, just before he gets up, it says there that Jesus, quote, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and knowing that he had come from God and knowing that he was going back to God. Do you hear the truth that he knew, that he was living in, that he was walking in, that he was utterly safe as God's son? Knowing that, what it says in John 13, knowing that, he laid aside his outer garments. This is a physical embodiment of the epistle we heard read this morning from Philippians 2. He lays aside his outer garments and he takes up the towel and he ties it around his waist. What is the true antidote to fear? It is indeed hearing and believing that you are who God says you are and that you and all that you have are safe in God's hands. And then letting that be your deepest and truest sense of self. What do you trust in for your well-being? What Jesus came to show us is what it looks like to live into the goodness and the reign of God. And there were ordinary people just like you and me around Jesus that had to wake up to this reality and had to learn it had to come to know it and experience it. He, he talked about it all the time to them. He said, I've come that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. And he says in another place, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. The question is, what is that thing that you trust in for your well-being? Your first sense of self must be as a disciple of Jesus that you're his child and that you're safe in his hands. It was at my own ordination that the bishop made me stand up. It wasn't part of the liturgy. He made me stand up in front of everybody. Nobody really knew what was coming. I didn't know what was coming. I wasn't warned. And he said, Brian, I want you to never forget that you are God's project. That 
God's project is not what you're going to do for him or he's going to do through you. It's what his kingdom is going to accomplish in your very own heart. And that project is a project of coming to know that you are utterly safe in his kingdom. How do we discover that place of safety? It's a truth to know, and you really, you have to experience it. The antidote to fear is hearing and believing that you are who God says that you are. The beauty is that you and I can't do that in our own strength. We can't. We can't accomplish that in our own power. What happens is that the power and the goodness of God meets us in our weakness. And it's a gift that can be received. We can be safe in the kingdom, but it points to the second part that I want you to hear. And yet we have a helper that we must invite. There's a truth to know, but there's a helper to invite. Jesus suffers this week. He will die on Friday and he will be forsaken by everyone he knows around him. But you and I will never be alone. How, how is it possible that you could explain the change that happens in the disciples from this week to the weeks that follow Jesus' ascension. If you look just at the life of Peter, how can you explain how he goes from being so afraid this week for his own life that he denies his Lord several times to him in the next few months standing up in front of the same people that crucified Jesus without fear? How do you explain that? You explain that by saying, well, the helper, the Holy Spirit came and met Peter in his brokenness and in his weakness. And the New Testament portrays this as a kind of dance, a, a countercultural movement in the way of Christ. I think it was Eugene Peterson that helped me to see this curious use of the word. Uh, I'm going to probably mispronounce it several times. Uh, Epikurigos. This is Paul's word that he uses to describe the work of the Holy Spirit in a few places. Uh, we know that the Holy Spirit helps us with the heavy lifting. The, the typical word that's used is the paraclete, the one who helps, the one who lifts up. He's the comforter. He's the helper. But it's not the word that's used in Philippians and Ephesians, just these two occasions. It's a strange word to talk about the Holy Spirit's work as the epikarigos. It, it's a word that we derive our word chorus from or cor choral. The idea of bringing it all together. It gets translated in Ephesians as being knit together as the church. That's what a good choir director does. I'm not musically gifted, but as a kiddo, I was in choir, and a good choir director knits everything to together. Uh, the whole choir comes together on not only the right beat, but the right note, the right harmonies. Uh, it's one of the reasons why being together in person can be so powerful when we are together, is, is we sing together. And something happens when we do that. In Philippians 1 verse 19, Paul says, I'm glad because I know that this will result in my release through your prayers. He's actually in prison when he writes this. And then he uses the word. I'm glad because I know this will result in my release through your prayers and the epikarigos of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Here's how I want to talk about it as we end. The choreography of the Holy Spirit as he works out my deliverance. Paul's in jail, he's even in chains, and yet he begins to put his faith in the choreography of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever watched a talented choreographer, but they see the whole picture. They know each movement. They know the script. They know what's coming next. It's not up to the individual to see the whole picture, but the Holy Spirit does. And even though Paul's in jail, and he could just say, you know, well, let's just pray that the prison doors get broken down. And on occasion that did happen. But here he prays to put his trust in the choreography. And we need this kind of prayer right now more than ever before. We have a helper to invite and you and I can entrust ourselves to his choreography in the midst of the challenges that we're undergoing. This is true corporately and it's true personally for your own home, your own family and friends. We did not anticipate or plan for this, if you'll allow me to say it this way, this change in script. Every one of our lives have been disrupted in some way. And here's a moment for us as his followers to not only trust in this truth that we can be safe in his kingdom, 
but to invite the help of the Holy Spirit and to begin to trust in a new way, in a profoundly uh, challenging moment, that we can trust in his choreography. Corporately, as a church, we were supposed to be gathered today at the YMCA. Uh, We weren't supposed to be on a video screen, uh, but we weren't even supposed to be meeting at our Morris Road facility. And now we have this disruption in our movement, this disruption in our plan. And and I'm asking and I'm praying together with you to say, Lord, would you teach us to trust in your choreography that now we would discern together how to love you, how to care for each other and how to be your church on mission in the world. Let's learn from Jesus this Holy Week. There's this truth to know that you are his child You are his precious son or daughter, and you are safe in his kingdom. And then would you invite the helper, the Holy Spirit? If you go on and read the verses immediately following, you see that Jesus really cares about his church being a church of prayer, his church inviting his presence and help. And the people who are welcomed in that moment, Jesus goes into the overturning of tables into the temple right after this majestic entrance. But you know know who's welcomed is the blind and the lame. Right here, this Holy Week, those who are blinded by their fear, those who are lame with their anxiety, meet Jesus and experience the goodness of his kingdom. Would you behold him who's going to conquer sin and death as he goes into Holy Week And would you begin to trust that you too can become his intrepid disciple? You may have heard the story, I love this little story, of the little girl that was trying to go to sleep one night and just couldn't. And she reached out to her mommy and her mommy says, honey, go back to bed. God will be there for you. And the little girl says, I know mommy, but I want someone with skin on them. What we know is that there was one day when God put on skin. That's what we heard read in Philippians 2. That being in the very nature of God, he didn't consider this equality with God something to be held on to, but he made himself nothing. He takes on the form of the servant. He takes on skin. And he's going to show us how to be intrepid. He's going to conquer fear. He's going to conquer death this week. Eventually, that week, at the state park, Jen, Tucker, I began to sort of chuckle because Emery finally made a shift and she began not only not being scared of these crane flies, but uh, she found it as a hobby to chase them around the park, to catch them in her hand. And um, our life has gotten more serious than that for us. The things that we're facing, the fears we're facing are more significant than that. But he will show us how to be set free from our fears, how to be a a person and a disciple that, that is intrepid in the midst of the challenges we're facing. It will require that you, like Jesus, humble yourself. And so this week, I want to encourage you, would you share, would you share your fears, your struggles with those who are near to you? Would you open up about how you're doing physically, emotionally, spiritually? Would you be vulnerable enough to invite other people into your life, even if it has to be, I guess it has to be, through a video screen or a phone call? And then secondly, would you see that this new freedom that he gives us, it's not just for us to keep to ourselves. It propels us to serve others. It always starts sometimes with just being there, just listening that's often what we need, isn't it? I, I, at the point of my deepest anxiety, I needed somebody who was just willing to listen. Um, and, I, and I found that. I, and you, you can find that, but you, you've got to ask, you've got to share, you've got to be vulnerable. But would you also in turn be that shoulder that somebody can speak up to and share a need? What we know is that when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2, when it's described again in Acts 4, that movement, When the Holy Spirit comes, that work of God, what happens is the church becomes a generous church. But people had to share their needs, including financial needs. And we're doing that. There's stories of that already happening in and through this parish. Let's be there for each other, for our community. Let's show one another in this region that God has indeed put on skin. And he intends us to go out into the world and to be his presence, his intrepid presence in the world. Let's pray together.
Father, we give you thanks and praise that, Lord, it's not up to us to work up this courage, but that it's a gift that you give freely without finding fault. And so we say, come, Holy Spirit, fill us with the courage to know that we are your children in the midst of this challenge. Fill us with hope in the midst of the, the pain and lament. Lord, and, and send us out. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear just like you, where we can weep with those who weep, we can mourn with those who mourn, and Lord, we can be people who are intrepid in the midst of the fear and panic. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.